I was at sea in command off the coast of Western Australia. Approaching the coast is dangerous in any vessel or can be. Approaching the coast dived and deep can be particularly dangerous. We put together a very detailed plan about what depth to travel at, what speed to travel at, when to come shallow. I can get nine minutes sleep out of 10 minutes flat on my back. So, and I had an opportunity for about 30 minutes sleep. I just laid my head down, been, been there for just a moment. And I looked up at our speed indicator in my control room. And I noticed that the guys hadn't reduced speed and I expected that they would have. But I thought, it's okay. They know the plan, they'll reduce speed. And I went to sleep. And the next thing that I felt waking me up was this fluttering sensation coming rising up through the bunk and sort of rattling my bones. And what that was, was the submarine coming up against the continental shelf. And we were now at depth and at speed and I was driving my submarine into the continental shelf. We grounded the submarine. Deep listening, impact beyond words. G'day, I'm Oscar Trimboli, and this is the Apple Award-winning podcast, Deep Listening, designed to move you from a distracted listener to a deep and impactful leader. Did you know you spend 55% of your day listening, yet only 2% of people have ever been taught how? In each episode, we explore the five levels of listening. Communication is 50% speaking and 50% listening. Yet as a leader, you're taught only the importance of communication from the perspective of how to speak. It's critical you start to build some muscles for the next phase in how to listen. The cost of not listening? It's confusion, it's conflict, it's projects running over schedule, it's lost customers, it's great employees that leave before they want to. When you implement the strategies, the tips and tactics that you'll hear, you'll get four hours a week back in your schedule. I wonder what you could do with an extra four hours a week. Retired Naval Commander Peter Scott has over 35 years experience in leading specialist teams in complex and demanding underwater environments. Joining the Navy as a 17-year-old midshipman, he rose through the ranks over three decades to become the head of the Navy's elite submarine arm. During that journey, Peter survived and led others through fires at sea, floods and explosions. A veteran of multiple special operations with the submarine arm, Peter's service included Iraq, the Persian Gulf, and Afghanistan. I went back into the early planning documents of the podcast, and in August 2016, I looked at the very first list of people we wanted to have a chat to. Acoustic engineers and actors, deaf and foreign language interpreters, judges, journalists, and many others. Yet the most elusive on that list proved to be the submarine commander. Now, six years later, I'm excited to understand how to listen under the water. Thanks to Kelly for the introduction to Peter. With Peter, we'll explore the role not only of a submarine commander, but the role of a sonar operator as well, or their official title, Acoustic Warfare Analysts. We get to go behind the scenes in one of the world's most complex and demanding listening environments and notice how professional acoustic warfare analysts listen. Finally, Peter explains what it's like to command a submarine that you crash under the water and the importance of listening to your intuition as a leader. Peter, what do you think the cost of not listening is? The cost of not listening is a matter of life and death. Submarines' greatest tactical advantage lies around their their stealth. To be able to do that, you need to understand your environment. And one of the principal ways we understand our environment is by listening. And if you are 
not listening well, if you're not listening to the very best of your ability, then the consequence can be measured in, in life, either your own or others. For many of us, the only way we know about submarines is what we see in movies, documentaries or TV shows. Peter, could you just zoom us in? What's the environment like? You're under the water for days, weeks, months? We'll very often head out away from home for six months. It might be seven, eight weeks between between ports. Our modern submarines spend most of that time dived. Older submarines used to transit on the roofs. It's very much a, a 24-hour operation. There's no weekends out there. Your submarine is a living, breathing thing, and it's up to the people on board to keep it living and breathing. Peter, what's the composition of a submarine crew? Very highly specialised crews on board submarines. We've got sonar technicians, we've got mechanical technicians, electrical technicians, we've got analysts, sailors and officers, folk who specialise in navigation, engineering and so on. One of the things that shapes how we go about things is that necessary stealth. And, you know, a warship does a lot of what it does through presence. They are very active. They will transmit on radar to understand what's around them. They'll transmit on sonar to understand what's under them. They'll communicate between ships and with the headquarters. And submarines very different, very much a passive approach. We don't transmit on sonar. We tend to intercept communications rather than send them. We'll use a periscope, which can't be seen. So it's very much about seeing without being seen, hearing without being heard, knowing without being known. It's quite different in that regard. And that shapes the way you go about everything. It shapes the preparations you make with your boat, the training you give your people. It shapes the way that we communicate amongst ourselves and the way that we do or don't communicate with others. Peter, in our last episode, we spoke to Natasha, former leader at West Point Military Academy, about the importance of acknowledging commands and orders ensuring that not only the command has been described, but it's also been understood. How does that happen in a submarine at the depths of the ocean? We are very deliberate with orders and reports and acknowledgements. If the officer of the day or the officer of the watch needs the engine room hatch open, engine room control room, open the engine room hatch. The acknowledgement will be a direct repetition of that. Control room, engine room, open the engine room hatch. And what that means is that you, you know exactly what you've said, he knows what you've said, and you know that he knows. There's, there's that clear clarity on what, what you've told them to do. They'll then go away and do it, and then they'll report in the reverse. So control room, engine room, engine room hatch open. Engine room control, engine room hatch open. So just order, acknowledge, report, acknowledge. And that sounds a little bit overdone. And when you're on board a submarine, it can become really confusing because particularly in intense situations, there can be scores of these orders and reports <laughs> moving around. The really important ones get conducted on main broadcasts. No matter where you are on the boat, you can hear it going on. But that happens because clarity is absolutely essential and, and the meaning is absolutely essential. That engine room hatch is down aft and it's low by the waterline and it's a bloody big hole in the submarine. And if you're about to dive your submarine, you want to know all those hatches are shut so there, there can be no confusion, no obfuscation. One of the things we talk about a lot is the importance of listening to yourself When it comes to a submarine, how does a submarine listen to itself? What we seek to do is (laughs) minimise the noise, quite simply minimise the noise that we're making that we have to deal with. The ocean is a really noisy environment. Oceans are filled with sound. There's geological sound like volcanoes, biological sound like dolphins and fish, man-made sound like ships and oil rigs out there. There's sounds amongst the sounds, and the job of our sonar analysts is to isolate and analyse and make meaning of that. 
one of the things that can interfere with their ability to listen to what's going on beyond is dealing with what's going on on the boat. Listening at level one, minimise distractions and minimise notifications and take three deep breaths is what we say for human interaction. Peter, I'm curious, is there a parallel process for the submarine and the interconnected systems that it's integrated to? How do you set up an environment where the submarine can listen to itself? When I was in command, we took uh, Collins to Alaska, bloody long way away. The reason we took her there was because the United States Navy has a acoustic range in a place called Beam Canal. And it's there because it's exceptionally deep, exceptionally quiet water. We took Collins there to take her over a range of acoustic hydrophone arrays and measure and record the acoustic signature of the submarines. The noise we made at different speeds, the noise we made with different pumps running. And it took 10 days to understand precisely what the signature was. But knowing that means that we can minimise our own noise and it means that if it is interfering with something, we can recognise it and discount it. It makes a huge difference to your ability to understand what's going on is your ability to understand what's going on internally. For me, there's a very direct correlation between conversations, your ability to quieten the noise that's going on inside you, emotional or otherwise, so that you can pay attention to what's going on. Peter, at the deepest and darkest parts of Alaska, you're in this canal and you have to test the vessel to see what kind of sounds it makes and how to adjust accordingly. Can you step us through how deliberate these tests are, the, the procedures to ensure that you can listen to what the sound signature is of HMAS Collins? It took us 10 days to do this. That's 10 days and 10 nights, just 24 seven. And some of the runs that we did were dived and underway. So moving through the water at different speeds. Some of the runs that we did were actually dived, but static. So the submarine was strung up between two massive buoys and then we were winched down several hundred meters into the sound. And we basically collapsed to a dead boat switched off everything. Generators, air conditioners, refrigeration, lighting, everything. It was eerie. You know, I'm used to living in a submarine, but but this was blacker than black, colder than cold. And then literally one by one, flick a switch. We'd spent probably a year communicating with the range earlier to help them understand what all the systems were on board and develop a process to shut everything down, bring everything up. And then we spent three to four days down there, deep and static, recording. We had communications with the range hut and they were sort of running the show. It was just through an umbilical wire going up. And very often they would say, switch on item number 77. And we would say, it's on. And they would say, well, there's nothing heard. You know, we, they just wouldn't detect anything. And that was the case for a lot of the stuff because it's just an exceptionally well-designed and, and built boat. G'day, it's Oscar. Creating the foundations for exceptional listening happens at level one, listening to yourself. In the case of HMAS Collins, they spent 240 hours continuously listening, noticing, reflecting, checking and preparing to listen over 14,000 minutes. I wonder how long you spent listening to yourself before a conversation. The Deep Listening Playing Card Series are 50 cards designed to help you and others listen better. Card number one, listening to yourself, is about the concept of distractions. It says, 
knowing that you will be distracted helps you notice your distractions faster. Similar to the procedures that Peter just outlined with the submarine, procedures help you focus on what matters. Think of the cards as your own set of procedures. The cards provide a tip. In this case, it says anticipate what might distract you in advance of the discussion. And then it poses a question. What am I most commonly distracted by? If you'd like to learn more, visit oscartrimboli.com forward slash cards. That's oscartrimboli.com forward slash cards. Peter, one of the things I notice working with leaders, what distinguishes good leaders from great leaders is the leaders who listen transactionally have a limited impact, yet the leaders, the great leaders who listen in a sustained and systematic way have an ability to listen to individuals, teams, groups, systems, and the interconnected systems in their environment as well. On the submarine, how did you listen and bring all these pieces together rather than just listening for one element? If we just start internal to the submarine, let's say we're at action station, so the control room is fully manned, your submarine's fully manned, and you've got little teams of people all over the place. You've got a sonar team doing their piece. You've got a track management team doing their piece. Ship control are keeping the the submarine on depth and on course. The engineers are keeping everything up and running. And there are lots of little conversations happening in there that are domain specific. But some parts of those conversations need to be shared to the wider team. The learning for your your people is knowing what to share and when and able to bring it into the dialogue at the right time. In the ordinary course of events, if a ship is detected by a sonar operator, they might need to tell the officer to watch. When you're at action stations, if that ship is classified as a warship, then you better let the captain know because it might be a threat or it might be a target. So that would be the time to break into the wider conversation that's been happening in the control room there. And that is about understanding not only your system but that wider system that's operating inside the submarine. And it's got to go beyond that as well. That really is about interpreting the relevance of the information that you have in the submarine to the situation outside. For someone like the the sonar operator, it is about understanding, okay, what's the situation that the submarine is in? What's the environment that it's in? What mission is it trying to achieve? And therefore, what relevance does their piece of information or their advice have? And is it more or less important than the report that's coming in from the electronic warfare operator or the report from the planesman about being on depth? Peter, the eyes of the vessel may be the periscope and the ears could be the sonar operators. Movies provide us with a very narrow perspective. We kind of see these people with very sophisticated audio and visual equipment, recording and listening for any squeak that could happen out there. How does a sonar operator learn to do what they do? It probably starts by making a commitment that they will be a professional listener. And there aren't many domains where you wear a badge as a professional listener, but that's fundamentally what they are. Their proper title is Acoustic Warfare Analyst. Perhaps a point to note is that on board a submarine, you might have a Jonesy, but it takes a team to have a complete sort of sonar effect. And typically that team will be three or four strong, junior up to fairly senior and experienced folk. They'll be broken into watches, so half the guys will be on for six hours and then they'll be relieved by another six. There's some rudimentary selection. They've got to have good hearing, but not exceptional or extraordinary, just good hearing. They've got to be able to live and operate as a submariner. So that's their specialisation, but they need to be able to contribute and work within the team in a whole lot of different ways. And then they do a lot of training. They're trained in 
the theory of acoustics, sonar propagation, and they're trained in the technical aspects of their equipment. The sonars that are built into the submarine and the equipment that they use to either listen to or view the sound. And also this recording machinery because a lot of what they need to do is record what's out there so that they can further analyse it later or so that it can be analysed ashore and shared. So a lot of technical knowledge and then a lot of practical application of that, both ashore in simulators and then at sea initially under supervision. When they're out there, we manage them pretty carefully. You cannot listen intently forever and you don't need to either, but you need to know when to listen intently. Six on, six off is one part of it. Like everyone on board, they need to be able to do that for weeks on end, but also we'll rotate them through the different sets. For 30 minutes, they might be manning this sonar, which is looking at this frequency. Then they'll rotate and look at another sonar operating principally at a different frequency and so on. Often the sonars are optimised for different ranges. Sound moves through water more effectively at low frequency than at high frequency. Sonars built for low frequency will detect a contact further out. Higher frequencies tend to be, you need to be either much more powerful or closer. They move through the sonars. They take breaks pretty often as well, just so that they can stay fresh. And they're always doing that cognitive comparison between what they're they're seeing, the, the displays of the, the sonar energy, and what they're what they're hearing. When you think about a shift, you've got six hours, you've got teams of two, three or four. I think that point you made, Peter, is very powerful. You can't listen intently forever. These professional listeners take breaks when it comes to their listening. So if you're listening right now, I've asked you on previous episodes, how do you recharge your listening batteries? And you've heard that a sonar operator takes breaks despite the fact that they are listening intently, they're listening visually, they're able to record everything. How do you take a listening breaks? How do you ensure that you change the context? to reset and recharge your listening. For me, it's really simple. What I do is I have three different songs that I play in between context switches so that I can recharge my listening batteries. I'm curious, uh, what songs might you listen to to recharge your listening batteries? For me, uh, the listening songs I listen to are very, very different. They're at three deliberately different speeds. They're three very different lengths as well. These songs are in order. Slowest beats per minute to fastest beats per minute. And it's also no coincidence that the ones that have the slowest beats per minute are longest and the ones with the fastest beats per minute are the shortest. So the first song for me, Weightless by Marconi Union, an instrumental. There are absolutely no words in this eight minute section. Thanks to Matt for the recommendation. The second one, five minutes, 52. It's Easy by Groove Armada. Thanks, Sarah, for the recommendation and your story about a festival where you heard this at. And then the last song, three minutes and 50 seconds, Remember the name, Fort Minor. Thanks to Holly for that recommendation. Each of these songs recharges my listening batteries very quickly. I'll be curious, which songs do you listen to that recharge your listening batteries? Or what techniques do you use to recharge your listening batteries? Send me an email, podcast at oscartrimboli.com. That's podcast at oscartrimboli.com. And let me know, how do you recharge your listening batteries? Let's go back to Peter. Peter, listening is an art and it's a science and interpreting at the depths of the ocean 
when we're listening mathematically, you'll literally see a visual representation of the audio signal on the acoustic warfare analyst's screen. So the, 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 there is a science to how you listen. There's also an art that's developed over decades and decades of experience. Oh, I'm, I'm curious, what do you think distinguishes a sonar operator, an acoustic warfare analyst that's listening beyond what they see and what they hear? Is it possible to listen for context, for unsaid and for meaning at the depths of the ocean? I did a job a couple of years on exchange with the Royal Navy and in one of their submarines. And we, we deployed from the UK through the Mediterranean and out into the Indian Ocean. And the environmental conditions out there were really quite dramatic. And I'm talking about the environmental conditions beneath in the water column. There was some very stiff, what we call layers, changes in temperature and changes in temperature and density in the water affect the path that sound will take. And one of the consequences of that was a ship could be fiddling along on the surface. And instead of us being able to hear that ship at a long range, the sound would literally be bent directly away from the ship and down through the depths to the bottom. We would have to be very close before we could hear it. And normally that's not a problem unless we're deep and trying to come up to periscope depth. Before a submarine comes from a deep position to periscope depth, we stand the sonar watch too, and they go through some procedures to make sure that they understand what's out there. We did that, and one of the things that the sonar guys noticed but didn't report was a, a rise in background noise on one bearing, and it didn't seem like much to that operator at that time. As we came up and I got to periscope depth and my little periscope popped out, the very first thing I saw was a warship that was very close and just driving almost directly at us. And we had to take the submarine deep in emergency very quickly. And I guess that sonar operator had not really paid attention to the context of the environment in which he was operating. Because if he had, then we would have been paying more attention to that and we would have been trying to understand that a bit more before we put ourselves in that situation. What else can acoustic warfare analysts, a sonar operator, teach us about listening? So I think one way is just to emphasise the preparation that they do and the structure that we put around the work that they do. If we're deploying a submarine into an area, we will put immense effort into understanding the environment we're going into, the sort of environmental conditions, the, the sort of shipping that we're likely to see. That helps us go into a situation prepared so that we can then adapt and learn as we go, but we're not starting from scratch. And typically if we're going somewhere, we're going for a reason and will very often be searching. Submarines are designed around their sensors. The hull is formed to minimise acoustic uh, noise from flow. The sensors are placed in the best possible position to receive what they need to receive, whether that's underwater sensors or, you know, masts and periscopes. We'll go into an environment very well prepared, drawing on experience, knowing what we're listening for. And then when we're there, We'll put a lot of effort into positioning the submarine in the right area, placing the sensors and optimising them. It might be making sure that you're able to listen most effectively down a bearing where you expect a threat to come from or being at the right depth where you expect to hear a submarine. It's about knowing what you're looking for and searching for that. You know, If you're searching in a conversational context or if you're searching for content or meaning, then know that and position yourself to do that and literally situate yourself in the right place at the right time and in the right state to discover. Have you noticed any variation between genders and how sonar operators listen across genders? Women get less distracted. They're actually better at paying 
finer attention for longer, paying, paying greater attention to the details for longer. How are you noticing that given you're behind them? It's in the body language. They've got headsets on and they can communicate quietly amongst each other or they can broadcast what they want to say. It's just from observing them. And this is curious because most of the time when I'm observing sonar operators, I'm actually observing the back of their heads. They're, they're all sat to their consoles. I'm behind them. I can see their screens better than I can see their faces. Most of their conversation and chit chat is internal and I can only really observe it and only need to observe it from the body language. The command in Australian submarine, I had to pass a submarine commanding officer's qualifying course. And the course that we do is with the Dutch. So we'd travel over to Europe. We'd spend months in a simulator training and then months at sea putting stuff into practice. At sea in a Dutch submarine. Now lots of Dutchmen and women speak English, but on their submarine, they speak Dutch. And I had this genuine and I thought valid concern about how the hell am I going to command these guys when I can't even understand the language they're speaking. But what I learned very quickly was that people are people. And if I'm looking at the back of two sonar operators' heads and they are being attentive, then I know. If they are calm and comfortable with the situation, I know. If they're not, if they're becoming agitated, I know. Peter, naval sailing and traditions are very ancient, and yet modern vessels, they're the ultimate technology weapons. But with all this technology, do you get blinded to too much technology? What do you think differentiates modern warriors under the water? Curiosity. Not being willing to allow something that you don't understand to pass you by. Always, and this is relevant for the, the sonar operators, ought to always be searching what is out there, what could be out there. What is this? What could this be? What else could this be? What does this mean for us? And you don't get that without without curiosity and without fostering your curiosity and building it and and honouring it. And in a submarine at sea, it's what keeps you alive. Tell me more about curiosity, Commander Scott. So, Oscar, I was at sea in command off the coast of Western Australia, and we had been working up our submarine. We'd been through a series of three months' worth of exercises, training and operating against warships, aircraft, submarines to get ourselves ready for a really significant and long deployment. And uh, everything had been going exceptionally well, right up to literally the, the last serial on the last night. We just conducted a simulated attack against some warships. I'd taken the submarine deep to evade. And our next serial was an inshore operation early the following morning. Approaching the coast is dangerous in any vessel or can be, approaching the coast dived and deep can be particularly dangerous. We put together a very detailed plan about what depth to travel at, what speed to travel at, when to come shallow, when to call me and so on. I left the team to it and went to get, I, I probably, I can get nine minutes sleep out of 10 minutes flat on my back. So, and I had an opportunity for about 30 minutes sleep. This is a story about curiosity, but it really it's about a failure of curiosity. I just laid my head down, been, been there for just a moment, and I looked up at our speed indicator in my control room, and I noticed that the guys hadn't reduced speed, and I expected that they would have. But I thought, it's okay, they know the plan, they'll reduce speed. And I went to sleep. And the next thing that I felt waking me up was this fluttering sensation coming rising up through the bunk and sort of rattling my bones and what that was was the submarine coming up against the continental shelf so we were now at depth there's a some there's a naval term called smelling the ground if you can imagine and we were now at depth and at speed and i was driving my submarine into the continental shelf we grounded the submarine 
Now, I left a hell of a skid mark on the bottom of the submarine. That was a failure of curiosity. My gut instinct told me that was wrong. And if I had, you know, made one remark to the officer watch at that time, that would never have happened. But I, I let it go and um, my lack of curiosity uh, almost had us undone. It could have been, it, it was not a great day. It could have been a disaster. Wonderful discussion about all elements of the listening. We went through all five levels of listening today with retired commander Peter Scott. Thanks again to Kelly for the introduction, and it was worth the six-year wait. I'm taking away a few things today that I will implement personally. I'll become a lot more conscious about instructions, clear instructions, making sure they're understood making sure I'm finding a couple more new songs to play to reset and recharge my listening batteries. I loved that Peter had the self-awareness to talk about when listening, or the lack of it, almost crashed the submarine. Peter's description about curiosity is really important, but I think his courage to speak openly and honestly about failure is what made him a successful commander. I'm curious if you'd like to share your listening failures with me. Let me know. Podcast at oscartrimboli.com. That's podcast at oscartrimboli.com. I'd be fascinated to understand when a lack of curiosity or transactional listening where you were only listening to the content showed up and created a disaster for you. Across my career, there were many times where my listening or lack of it showed up. I can remember way back in the 1980s where I was installing some accounting software for a client and we had anticipated it would take three hours for the installation to take place and every hour the client would check with me and I told them every time that it would be completed at noon. We started at nine o'clock. At noon, the client came up and said, is it installed yet? And I hadn't completely finished, but I should have taken the time to listen to the client and understand what was driving the noon deadline for them. They needed the computer. They needed the computer to do a very important task, paying the employees payroll. My lack of listening at that very early age almost cost my company a huge client. If I'd taken some time at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, or 11 o'clock to ask the client what's behind your deadline, maybe there wouldn't have been as much tension in the client relationship as I created. So I wonder what your listening disasters were. When did you crash your submarine at the bottom of the ocean? Thanks for listening all this way. There's a little bonus at the end of this episode where Peter and I talk through the concept of swinging the compass. This is a tradition that evolved from wooden ships to steel ships and its impact on the compass. And it's got some pretty good correlations for listening to yourself at level one. It's well worth the time. Please listen. I'm Oscar Trimboli and I'm on a quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the world. And you've given me the greatest gift of all you've listened to me. Thanks for listening. Are you are you familiar with the practice of swinging a compass? Tell me more. Magnetic compasses are obviously subject to magnetic variation mm. and they're also affected by the, the metal components of the ship. Swinging a compass is about uh, a ship at anchor and and literally it is it is swung around the anchor a full 360 degrees and the variation on the on the compass is measured every sort of five or six degrees around and there's rods and bars on a compass that you can adjust 
to balance out the variations. It'll take a day to swing a compass, particularly on a really big ship, but it's it's worth doing for neutralising those little index errors in the in the compass.